Hello, everyone. This is Ed Brenniger, and welcome to the Eddie Network podcast. My guest today is Jason Barnes, and Jason is a, a trained engineer, but he's not doing engineering work anymore. He's doing other stuff that is really fascinating, and it's all new to me, and I think it's all new to me, and I'm looking forward to our conversation today. Welcome, Jason. And Thank uh, you, Ed. I'm very much looking forward to our conversation today as well. Tell us, uh, tell us a little bit about who you are and, and uh, what you're doing, and that kind of gets us into the kind of the this meat of of your your and Jennifer's work. Sure thing. So uh, I'll kind of start with where we're at right now, and then back up a little bit. That kind of shows a little bit of picture of how we got here. But uh, you may have heard Ed mentioned here too that you know Jennifer Hunter is my business partner in a, in a venture we've got called Jensen Design. And one of the very common things that when you know talk about Jensen Design, we get asked like, "Design? What do you design? Is it web pages? Is it interior design?" Um, but we really design experiences. Uh, I like to say that we architect and facilitate collaborative design experiences. We get groups together, working together on common projects, and trying to bring a common perspective around you know what could happen together when we work together. Um, Jennifer and I actually met at the Purdue University uh, campus here in Fort Wayne in the area of systems engineering. I started as an engineer. I'm not quite doing engineer these days. But we started by bringing, uh, I think, probably one of the hardest groups to get to work together, uh, faculty in an engineering school <laughs> across multiple disciplines, uh, talking together and thinking about what we could achieve if we actually worked together and started trying things together, uh, being very experimental, thinking about what could happen uh, by letting the emergent happen and setting the conditions that the emergent can happen. So, so let's, let's step back from that. So this yeah. is what you're doing. But what was it that led you to describe it? <clears throat> Give us a sense of what, what was the situation, the circumstances that led you to see that this is what was needed to be done? We get a life story now. <laughs> All right, I like life so I, you know, I went to school as an electrical engineer. But uh, as any good engineering student should do, I, I took some, uh, you know, general education classes in the process. And uh, one of the first things that kind of started shaping my experience is this idea that uh, from, I took a psychology class, and I call it the fundamental attribution error, that we often judge ourselves uh, by, you know, what we have as our intentions, uh, but we often judge other people by what we see as their outcomes, the results. Um, and so that just initially kind of said, oh, it started taking my mind. I, I need to be open to what other people think and say, and, you know, I don't know their experiences. And it started making me feel a little bit more connected to the world because I had started as an engineer, very much thinking that I could be the mastermind. I could, I could solve all these problems. <laughs> you know, I will be the one to see all the pieces and be able to put them all together. Um, and that still kind of stuck around. And I worked as a system engineer, uh, for 12 years in industry doing similar kinds of things, trying to be the person to connect all the pieces together. Then I started working at the university in our system engineering center at our Purdue Fort Wayne campus. And I'll share a little project on there because it really was a moment for me that kind of changed my life. Uh, we got to work with this group that was working around this idea of healthcare for children in our community. And they had set up these seven different areas to kind of focus on you know specific aspects and kind of common areas and groups to work together so they had a group of physical health and physicians and doctors uh, they had a group of mental health experts they had a group of social services one for education uh, but one of them was a spiritual group and they had uh, representatives from unaffiliated churches uh, from around the county uh, working together and they kind of through this process, uh, it wasn't us leading the process, we were just kind of helping out with it and kind of participating as much as we could. Uh, but they asked people about, you know, what would make an impact in the community? What can we do to start? Um, what approaches should we take? And without fail, all the groups created these amazing plans of, you know, something that was going to make a huge difference in moving things forward. And there was pretty universal agreement that they were important, great plans. Uh, none of those plans I did I ever see anything actually happen in them, except for one. And that was the spiritual group. 
And at the time, I actually wasn't very spiritual myself. I was, I was not raised in a way that I was going to church. Um, but this group, actually, they didn't try and think about what could be possible if everything aligned. They thought about realistically what, what they could do with what they had. And so they did things, you know, they ran a little soup kitchen. They, you know, so oh, we can host a night and get some students in there. We had one person who said, I can just have a youth talk group. And it seems small, but those incremental improvements and setting the stage to do something bigger, you know, I had this great realization in doing that, that it's not about being the mastermind. It's about finding and building connections to do great things together and doing the doable. And part of that is just appreciating what everybody's bringing to the table. Everybody has something unique and special that they can do as part of working together. And it's finding a way to unite those things around a common purpose. And a lot of the work we do at Jensen is about bringing, bringing groups together to do that kind of thing. And I'm really happy, like, you know, I went through all that time as an engineer knowing that I could do it, but this, the stuff I'm doing now is fulfilling and I really love doing it. And, you know, I don't tell Jennifer I said this, but, you know, if they said, hey, we can't pay you for this anymore, I'm like, ah, oh, well, how do I keep doing this? <laughs> because I don't know that I can go back to the way I used to do things. So you you have um, uh, articulated a an idea that I've had for a long time as well, which is that uh, impact is a product of lots of small actions, small steps. And one of the principles I have is start small, um, act locally, share globally, and take the long view. And 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 so what what is it that you think that causes us to want to think in big big terms and in big changes and big projects and why is it that we choose to do that rather than the small stuff? I think you know some of it, and this comes from my own perspective, is ego. Um, you know, I, I wanted to be the one who figured things out and say that I connected it all. And it's hard to take credit for the little things that you do that enable something bigger later. Um, I think some of it is just feeling like it gets done. I, part of me wonders if, and I don't know if you've seen this as well, Ed, that, you know, you kind of feel like if I get started, but I don't finish it, did I really doing it, do anything without realizing that, you know, that's kind of the way it has to work. And you're not doing it because it's the best way. It's the way that works. <laughs> I don't know. What have you yeah. found out? I think that um, what what it, what is the reality is that there's nothing that ever finishes. Everything mm -hmm. is in kind of an evolutionary state, constantly changing or emergent state. And and if you take that attitude, then you can do these little things, knowing that it's leading to more of these little things. But the cumulative effect is greater. And and the challenge, see, I, and I also think that the the big big project gets focused on the leader of the big project and they have to be they get they're going to drive it to they're going to drive it because their reputation is on the line and no one else's is i think when we when we go to smaller you know this ian e. F. schumacher's small is beautiful uh idea then what we have a chance to do is is get other people to start doing things to contribute and they can and even more so they can contribute from in the manner that they feel like they can contribute i i'll just give you one illustration i um uh, i uh ended up taking over my son's boy scout troop as the scoutmaster and we had a small troop of about 12 boys when i took it over and um and there was only and this the scoutmaster had left and they're a cloud. So there was just me and these two guys who were 20 years old. So I was the only one who, who could do this, you know, logically. And so I took it on. And within two years, we were we had um a, a troop of 48 boys, and I had 19 adult leaders. And and the question is, there were two things that came from that. One was I, I just said, I'm going to do what I know how to do, which I thought, which is talk to people, encourage them, 
and remind people what our values are and then and then say i'm going to support you in whatever you want to do so is it camping is, is that what you want to do is it merit badge stuff what is it that you want to do what do you feel like is your best place to contribute and i would say and you don't have to tell me that you just have to go do that and whatever you want to do i'll support you and that transformed that through from this little tiny thing um which people thought was a big thing into a big thing because it was a lot of tiny things going on. Well, I love that too. And um, I'm not quite ready to make that jump. I am one of those assistant leaders for my boys, Boy Scout troop. <laughs> and uh, I'm very happy for the leader we have. And it's right at that level where we probably would love to do that kind of transformation and do more. But I also love that we are, we're kind of enabling the boys to do what they want to do. Um, and good, I, good word enabling is a good word for that yeah yeah and i love in in your kind of story there too that difference between done and doing um there's so many organizations and groups we work with want the done but i i wholeheartedly agree that you know we should always be doing and kind of coming from this idea of you know, engineering and where I came from the background, we worked with a lot of people who worked in, you know, they had departments or groups that always talked about continuous improvement. Um, that, you know, hey, this is great right now, but we could always be doing better. And the things we do should be lessons that teach us uh, how to do better and do more. And it's been great working with a few organizations in my time uh, at our system engineering center, and then also as Jensen, that really have embraced, you know, I always called it continued improvement for a lot of organizations where they would, you know, do something according to a plan, maybe a year down the line, look back and reflect and think about what they would do differently. But what does it take to actually bake in that continuous part to really be the way you're operating to always be the second you see a better way, you do the better way <laughs> to, to be willing to learn um, and leverage everybody who's doing things because you can learn from someone working on a line. You can learn from someone who is a support person. You can learn, you can learn so much from all those people and it shouldn't just be someone at the top creating a plan and then reflecting at the end what they learned and changing the plan for everybody else. It, it sounds like you're also touching on the fact that our our individual potential and therefore the potential of our groups and organizations, communities is really unlimited if we allow ourselves to think in those terms. Hmm. And we can do, we can do, we can do and achieve almost anything we want if we allow ourselves to think in the right way, which is not um, kind of constrained and compartmentalized, but this idea of in constant growth and constant motion um i think that's there's something to that and i'll fully admit the part that's really excites me and kind of attracted me i think to engineering in the first place and the work we do is that that space of trying and learning um as i taught students you know in engineering design you know they would i you know they were freshmen coming in for the design class i taught and so this was their really first experience to the idea of design. And so often, you know, up to that point, you've been taking lots of math and physics classes. And, you know, you go, did I get the right answer? You know, there is an answer that you know is right. And you should, can check it off in the book and show, that, show your work and make sure you got it right. And design is asking a different question. It's saying, you know, what should we do to address this problem? What should, you know... What could we do? We have no way of knowing what the best answer is. We can just find out an answer that, and to some status of how good it is. And all the times a student would come in and say, I failed, my idea didn't work. I said, you didn't fail at all. You just learned more than anybody else whose solution just worked the first time. You only failed if you stop. Absolutely. And so <laughs> what can you do to take those things you're learning and apply them in a new way? And I love setting up little experiments in ways that, I mean, I I intend to fail. I intend to learn yeah. that learning is the real outcome. It's not being done. Yeah, I, I, I don't know who, who actually said it. I heard it attributed to a, a movie director, but you know, this movie director said, a film is never finished, it's only abandoned. 
And I think a lot of the things we do, you know, find uh, find their way into that sense of incompleteness that if we were to stick with it, we would find a way to bring it to some further level of completeness that really does then contribute in a way that makes a difference that matters. Yeah. And that's that's the true engineer's mantra. You know, you you're stuck in an organization where they want to sell something, you know, you feel like you have to be done at some point, but it's good it's never done. It's just good enough to move forward, right? <laughs> yeah, I I had a guy uh, comment on one of my Substack posts this morning. He says, I just thought I'd point this out to you. You could be a little clearer here. <laughs> so, yeah, you're right, you know, all the time. And I went and looked at it and I, I ended up editing the whole 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 article and it had been, and it had been written last year. I mean, it was so, um, that, isn't that the way it is with us that we we feel this sense of needing to be perfect and that everything we do has to have this level of percept, perfection. And I wonder why organizations kind of breed that kind of mentality. What do you, what do you think? And I think it's just valuing immediate outcomes. And I, I think as a, you know, a systems person, I think a lot of us see the systems that are spatial, you know, the interconnections between, you know, this group over here and this group over here and how they interface. Uh, but I think we neglect to see the benefit of things that happen over time. And it's easy to see an immediate outcome and the result of an immediate decision. Um, but if you learn something and what it enables to happen later, and I know in one of my earlier conversations uh, with John Morley, when I first started meeting with him and Jennifer and I were kind of having some really nice uh, trios of talks, uh, something he kind of spurred in me uh, talking about it. But I thought about my son at the time was doing Little League. And, you know, my son didn't want to go up there and strike out, you know, and so he wasn't swinging so much but it, it was little league it's everything if he enjoys baseball and wants to keep playing it's not about that at bat right. if you view that at bat as successful whether you strike out or not or get out you know that's a really short view but if you care about baseball and want to do it longer as at the time i think he was 12 you know swing the bat see what you can do with it learn from the experience if you go stand there that's nothing that's going to translate to anything later. Um, and we told them we'd be perfectly happy. We're not going to be mad at him if he strikes out. You have to, as an organization, value doing things that you know aren't going to get you an immediate outcome, um, that are more about learning, that are more about, you know, setting up the emergent and what could happen later um, and being okay with that being a little vulnerable. But I know that most businesses don't think that way, especially from a financial aspect. Can you describe one of the um, projects you, that you all have done that um, has been real successful in achieving what this is about? Yeah, and I think a really good example is one we, um, it's really, it's a bittersweet moment, I would say, and that uh, we've been working with a group related to childcare in Northeast Indiana, realistically for about a year and a half on uh, different aspects, bringing kind of a regional coalition together um, and then developing individual county coalitions to basically support um, early learning and childcare in all different aspects and really get all the pieces together of what's important around that. Um, and I say bittersweet because We've done great things and we see them, but we're kind of launching them. This is, we're wrapping up our engagement with them. And Jennifer and I say a lot that, you know, we don't want any long-term clients. The idea of what we do is, you know, we can bring and facilitate uh, groups to come together and collaborate and show them a lot of different mindsets and approaches and give them a few tools. Uh, but we want to equip them to be successful without us. And so it's really about you know, helping them come together, realize that, you know, we are not subject matter experts in childcare and or in early learning. Um, but maybe we are subject matter experts, at least at this group, and convening and collaborating and finding ways to get groups to unite around a common purpose. And so with this particular project, we started off talking with people in the region of what would it look like to bring groups together to, you know, 
be in some kind of coalition or network that really is all moving together um, in Northeast Indiana around making change to early learning and childcare. So at the regional level, we care a lot about messaging, advocacy, you know, trying to uh, appeal up to our legislature here in Indiana, uh, but also uniting and sharing best practices. One of the things we learned is people working in individual communities felt like they were in silos and didn't have connections to each other. Uh, then we kind of undertook some work to work in counties. So we had two of 11 counties in Northeast Indiana, um, had pretty long-standing county coalitions and a, that county coalition kind of serves as uh, there's a coordinator within that role who acts as a liaison between businesses, childcare providers, um, the schools kind of trying to bring a community approach to making things happen. You know, they can't be the person to open a child care center, but when someone says, hey, I want to open one, hopefully the, the person helps connect them to the people who can help them do it. Um, and so we had two of those that were in place for a while and one that had just started. And so we've been working with eight of those 11 counties uh, to really get those child care coalitions started and hire a coordinator who could start being someone who cares full time around that and we you know bringing people together we didn't know exactly we knew kind of a fuzzy picture of what that looked like to work together and what we were trying to work towards but through the time spent with them we realized that there are very important components to what a child care coalition should be built around around access and capacity that you know there need to be seats for you know kids to be able to attend and that they need to be accessible to all families there's an aspect of quality that we want the best early learning experiences because what happens in the years zero to five really impact what happens so much beyond later in that you know, child's life. We cared about affordability. Um, and part of that is, you know, we just believe it's kind of something that is a right for someone to be able to provide this for their, their children. But we also understand that uh, that affordability aspect is an economic development piece and that having parents who can actually send their children to daycares and go to work um, enables so much more economic productivity within a county. Uh, but then there's also a sustainability piece, piece, you know, kind of that thing, what do you need to invest in that you're still learning and that you're getting better in the future? Um, you can do these things and open a center right now, but if it's not sustainable, you know, it's not really beneficial for the long run. In fact, it might even harm things. And so we brought a lot of unity around what it looks like for a community to build those. And at this point now, we're hoping that all 11 counties here actually have a running coalition with a coordinator in place. Uh, we, our hope was by uh, 2024, I, I think it'll be sometime during 2024, but it's not gonna be January 1st, 2024, it looks like right now. Uh, but that's fantastic to get this network of people all working together for a common thing and have a way of collaborating where they all wanna get something different out of it but uh, they can unite around that common purpose related to, it's common purpose related to children, community prosperity and economic development as well. You know, um, I think it's fantastic. And I see what you're doing in, as a representation of what I was doing 20 years ago. So it's very similar. And, but this is, this is the difference that I see. And I'd like you to speak to this. What I found 20 years ago was that in many cases, people saw these little projects as the end in itself. We're going to do this project and it will, it's what we're supposed to go do. We're supposed to do this project. We're supposed to have this collaborative thing. We're supposed to, you know, talk about where our future is. But it oftentimes it didn't go beyond that. What I'm hearing you say is that you all are, are not just driving, coming together and doing projects, but you're also driving, um, you're, you're, cat, you're a catalyst for these organizations to be responsible and you're giving them a, what's the word I wanna use? A, um, a, uh, an attractive way to, to build a, for, to fulfill that responsibility in the future. And um, so that this is 
not just a collection of people. We come together, we do that stuff, and then we part and go our ways, and nothing ever changes. But this is really asking the question of what is it that needs to change here in order for these outcomes to be realized? That's a great question, Ed, and I think a, a, a great insight in that I will say that we are providing, as we work to these, we're providing what we call tools. You know, here's something you can do to you know, run more effective meetings. Here is something you can do to build mission, vision, and values with your organization. Here's a tool. Um, and those are super useful for doing startups or even just running, you know, a network coalition organization in general. Uh, and then we have some methods. You know, how do you string those things together? How do you deliver them in an effective way? Uh, those are useful too. We're demonstrating those uh, and showing that, hey, you know, we're leading a meeting and we've modeled it for you. And now, you know, you can facilitate those meetings without us. But I think the most important thing we're giving them is a mindset and really letting them know that, you know, the first project you do isn't going to be the one that changed and we stop. And one great example is as we've been working together, um, there's actually a new organization that's starting up here uh, in Allen County. Uh, where Fort Wayne's at. And so they had a coalition actually uh, before we got started that kind of, you know, died down during COVID and they were trying to start back up thinking. And they learned a lot of lessons that first time about what they needed to do. But one of the biggest problems in childcare is funding. Um, everybody's fighting for funding instead of collaborating for funding. Uh, that, you know, that competition makes it so that there isn't a lot of you know, talk between organizations and they generally don't get on the same page and work together. Uh, and then within that, you know, it's so many of those people, the people, the thing they do that is collaborative is such a small piece of what their organization does in general, that it is very much that, oh, you, we come together, we do our little thing, and then we go back to our own organizations. Uh, part of this way of working together, you know, we've been talking with them, a great opportunity emerge where a new organization is starting in Allen County that wants them to be a part of it, that is going to come with funding, that's going to be aligned. And that organization, we want you to have your coalition housed within us, and we want you to run it the way you want it. They'd never be able to execute on that opportunity if they hadn't been working together and practicing that ability to, to collaborate. And so it's that mindset of like, it's not about this right now. It's about what it sets you up for. Continue thinking this way. And when those things emerge, you'll be ready to capitalize on them. So, you know, uh, this is following up on my question. This is my follow up to my question then in <laughs> your answer. It seems to me, and I'm, I'm trying to nail a, a, a signpost or a milestone marker in our conversation because I, I, you know, what I'm hearing you say is that we have we have gone through a transition in the way organizations view themselves, and they now recognize that all the things we did in the past aren't working any longer. If they ever did work, they're not working any longer. And we and we have to go do something different, mm -hmm. and that openness to being different than we have been is is the is the is this opportunity moment that does it come on very often. Do you feel that too? I do. And I, I'd love to see what your reflection is to this thing I'm going to say here too, uh, because I feel like we're still in the learning phase. And what I've seen a couple of organizations we've worked with is they, they see this and they go, oh, this is a fantastic new way of doing things. And they see a little bit of success and they switch back to, the, it's like, oh, we got the success we wanted. Let's go back to the old way of doing things. <laughs> uh, because it like that sets them up to go run in the way they used to be. And it reminds me a little bit of with COVID, you know, how many of the groups said, at least here in Indiana said, you know, oh, this is the new normal, but the new normal was the operation to get back to the old normal. <laughs> yeah. Um, and that it's, it might take a couple of times before this becomes the modus operandi that they actually want to do all the time instead of doing something as a nice little injection to get to the next place. What have you seen? I see that um, people, uh, so much to say, I see that people feel like nothing is working and they care about, they care about their communities, they care about their schools, 
They care about the hospital system. They care about kids. They care about, they care about things. And, um, and, and let's just say this, you know, say there are 20% of the community who feel this way. It may not be that much, but the 80% are just kind of lost and not really conscious of what's going on. And they're just reacting to whatever they see on social media or on the TV news or whatever. So they're kind of lost and they don't know what, and they, and you can't even pitch to them the idea of change because they don't even know what that means. They're just, they really are lost and, um, and isolated. They're isolated emotionally and intellectually and spiritually, and it's really difficult. So that's a large group out there. But there's this other group that's emerging, and I think that's the exact word for it. It's emerging out of a sense of disruption of all the normality, and they realize that the normal was not as healthy for them as they thought it was. And 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 so I think the big the big thing was, I really like working from home. Oh wow, I don't want to go back to the office. And uh, and then when their bosses say, "Well, we want you back in the office," I don't want to come back. So they quit. They quit. I mean, I mean, the fact that people are quitting their jobs just is uh, stunning, stunning to me. So I think we're on the cusp of something. We're not in it yet. We're on the cusp of some some dynamic change, where um, and I think it will resonate more at the local level than it will at any other level. And and I think kinds of things that you and Jennifer are doing, and John is are doing, are really really significant. So um, let's talk about how a person or a group can find the kinds of people that you you all are, and 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 what are the questions? What let me let me say, let me go with it this way. What are the questions that a, an individual and an organization needs to be asking today? that puts them in the position of being able to see the horizon of the future, which is so different than what the, what it was in the past. So I, I, this is a big question. And uh, one of the things that, you know, is people ask me, you know, especially, you know, friends who, you know, or just tangentially know maybe my background in history is like, Oh, what are you doing now? What does your company do? And, you know, I start to describe it, oh, oh, consulting. So you're a consultant. And I, we try not to call ourselves consultants because I don't know anything about childcare. I, anything I know, I learned from being part of this project. Um, generally, we work with organizations. We are not subject matter experts in what the organizations do. And a lot of times that first step is getting the organization to realize they are the subject matter experts. And it might not be the people up in the C-suite. It might not be the managers. It might be, There is a lot of knowledge that happens at every little place within an organization. Amazing. But they're generally not structured in a way to share that knowledge and leverage it. Um, and so what we do is we, you know, there are people out there like us who try and create new opportunities and structures and approaches uh, to bring groups together to have conversations about seeing what we've learned together and creating not just learning, uh, but collective learning. What can we learn from sharing our perspectives together? And as kind of you talked a little bit before about um, maybe some of the contentious things that happen and disagreements and different mindsets, one of the best things I've learned, and we, you know, this has kind of been baked into our approach at, we use at Jensen, but it actually took a little bit of reflection after the fact to kind of realize that what was happening. Uh, but we kind of realized that we were bringing groups together that typically had argued or disagreed in the past, that yeah. they had conflict of, you know, I want this, I want this. And we tried to create experiences and ways of bringing it that it was less about what's happening in the middle and looking alongside each other and trying to understand each other. And what we find very often is that, you know, whether it's going back to work um, and working in the workplace, we, you know, the, the manager who wants you back in there, as well as the employee who doesn't want to go back in, we actually want the same thing. We want to be productive. 
Um, we want to feel empowered to to do things that make us better. Um, yeah. We just have very different views on the solution to that. But if you argue about the solution, you miss the fact that you agree on what you could do together. And when you agree on that part, you can change that conversation and find something that is a solution that works for both of you. And it doesn't have to be one or the other. And I love that innovative part that allows you to kind of reimagine things based on a shared common purpose, as opposed to convening against each other for differing solutions. So what you're saying um, aligns with my little model, my mm -hmm. circle of impact model. I love the circle of impact. Let me just let me describe this to people. So what we're seeing is a shift away from a structure-centric organization mm -hmm. to one where values and purpose and relationships are kind of the centerpiece. And we build from there, and then we decide well, what kind of structure do we need, not mm -hmm. what do we do with the structure we have. And, mm -hmm. and that, to me, is, is the extent that may be one of those also milestone moments of seeing that this is this is the world we're in, and uh, and so we we are building relationships, we're building networks, and you know hopefully we can survive whatever the the, the big shots at the top of the of the hierarchies are doing, but uh, I think we'll be able to, and that and I'm more encouraged now than I was two years ago. Me too. So, and I think there have been all these little things that seem like trouble. And I think I was talking with uh, Jen Hooten uh, and she had said something that she loves those little bits of tension and working those because yeah. that's something where things will change. You know, the tension creates a need for change that she absolutely loves going to address. And I kind of reflected when she told us that. And it's like, you know, right, that's right. It's when everything's hunky-dory, it's hard to get people to change their mind, even if they need to. <laughs> but it's where someone's struggling and that struggle becomes something as an impetus that we can, but it's not about squashing it. It's about finding a way to make it better. So let me ask you, I, I uh, this is this is really out of left field. It just crossed my mind. It, it feels like we are talking about Ted Lasso's world. <laughs> have you watched the series? Oh, I have. Fantastic. <laughs> and, we're, and we're talking about the way he he operates his team. I know you're a little worried now, but that's yeah. Man. My camera loves to just kind of every once in a while. That's go out that's, the team. that's that's all right. We're good. And um, there we are. Magic. <laughs> so I, I encourage people to watch Ted Lasso because I think it's a it's a picture of what we want. It's a picture of what we like, and the characters are really great and. Um, the principles are, are all there. So what do you see there that has really appealed to you? And um, and maybe you use these illustrations with your with your kids and with your clients. And but, uh, Well, I'm going to share a little bit of knowledge I learned. So when I was at the System Engineering Center at Purdue Fort Wayne, I, uh, I was the associate director of our center. And I got the chance to work under our, our director, whose background is manufacturing, but took a very unique and our approach to things. And one of the things that he shared uh, based on his research and kind of that he had developed, it was what he called the flame model. And it kind of shows that in any kind of system, there are these different levels. Um, so the most visible thing to see is our work connections, the things we do that are very easy to observe. Um, under that was the structure. Um, and then there's a thinking layer of what's going on and the reasons why we do things. And then this idea of mindset or tone down at the bottom. And a lot of times when we look at systems, we take a very outside in approach where we see the work in actions. We use that to understand the structure. And then we guess and try and determine what the thinking is and it, or it drives our thinking about it. Um, and that affects our tone. It affects the way we approach people. If we think the system is broken, we might not care and try. Our tone becomes lackadaisical because we think that our structure is against us. But part of the way we tried to approach system design was to start with tone. What are the values you want to have? What's the thing that matters? And when it comes to Ted Lasso, very much, it's not about those work and actions of winning a game up there. But if you have the right tone of like, this is about people, 
This is about relationships. This is about letting people express themselves and be free and be who they need to be, who they want to be. Those other things come. Um, and enabling that is great. And so that idea, and really they called it, he called it the flame model because, you know, all those things exist in a the system. They're not independent of each other. They all interact with each other. But the part in that middle that burns the hottest is that tone. And we can be intentional about it and use that to create a system that works for us. Yeah. Or it can be the thing that we have that we let the system inflict on us. And that's what Ted Ted gets. He's mm -hmm. got the he's got that tone thing down. You know, <laughs> you know, don't worry about wins and losses. And you know, it's it's, it's a remar it's a remarkable image of the future it's really it mm -hmm. really is and so um well this has been really great i uh, i know we could keep going and may, maybe we should i know <laughs> but uh because I, I think we just scratched the surface but maybe we'll come back and we'll talk about things that are more specific and i and i i see that with a lot of my guests that we're 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 going we're being very general and very kind of inch deep, you know, so that people kind of get accustomed to this kind of talk that we're having. But at some point we need to we need to go deeper deeper. So maybe we can do that. So, so tell it. us how to find uh you all and do you go beyond uh just northeastern uh Indiana in terms of your service area? So we've been working a lot in Northeast Indiana, but we're starting to spread our wings and especially working with John Morley out in Silicon Valley. We're looking at other opportunities out there. Um, one of the neat things that COVID did for us was, you know, we were used to working with people hands-on, uh, but the ability to do things virtually, uh, even some collaborative things virtually, and some of the tools out there are fantastic, uh, Zoom included. Uh, it's allowed us to do, there's still a lot of value in doing things in person. And we there are things that we almost, staunchly believe like we need to do this in person because you want to build that relationship of right that. I totally agree. but there's so much you can do online that it's still so worth doing so we are you know we are not limited to northeast indiana and in what we do um and for those looking for information about us uh the best place is probably our website jensendesign.com or uh follow us on linkedin uh since we brought in john morley as strategic collaborator uh I am not the best. I love talking. I love conversations. That's that's my secret. I I have a hard time getting out of my head writing. I constantly revise things. Uh, on the other hand, John is a fantastic, you know, producer of materials. Uh, I don't know if he's as prolific as you are, Ed, but uh, I know your secret is to keep ahead of the game. But uh, Work we have a lot of content out there, and we are more than happy to connect with you on LinkedIn. Continue having these kinds of conversations. I always invite hey what's it look like to sit down and talk for even 15 minutes but you know most of the conversations end up going over an hour because it this is inspiration for me and hopefully it's inspiration for whoever i might talk to that this is a great way to just really say ah oh, there are people who think this way out there and encourage me to go keep doing well for me um, i am extraordinarily honored to meet people like you and i'm not i'm not blowing smoke um you know, honor, honor is my, the central core value for me. And so I feel an honor to meet people who are, are doing things that are really significant. And maybe people don't even know that that's happening, but I'm being able to see that and have this conversation. So thank you, Jason, so much for being here. And we'll, uh, we'll, we'll stay connected. And uh, I'll be interviewing Jennifer, I think, uh, maybe next week or the week after and uh, look forward to hearing her take on all this and tell her I said hello no I <laughs> it's been uh, oh, a you'll great see pleasure on mine as well Ed <laughs> and, and uh, so I'm I'm grateful for your coming on and we'll and we'll put everything that uh, we need to do to uh, for you to be to, to, to connect with you all on uh, in the show notes so, so thank, thank you, you very much I very much appreciate the opportunity to come talk with you today yeah uh, me too I I enjoyed it so and thank you all for watching. Make sure you hit the like button, subscribe, and in particular, respond, ask a question, uh, make a comment. It's important and it's valuable. And it allows for us to uh, interact with you. And, and if we can start a conversation with you and maybe your group or your organization, that's, that's, why we're, that's why I'm doing this. And connecting you to Jason or to anyone else that's been on the podcast 
is a part of what this uh, this is all about. So thank you all for watching, and thank you, Jason. We'll see you again soon, I'm sure, and we'll see you next time here on the Eddie Knapper podcast. Bye-bye.